this is a great question. So can you incarnate just one at a time or multiple? Um, if you're a young life, you will live your whole life, or a young soul, you will live your whole life, finish it, do some review, do some lessons, and then start your next life. When you're a more experienced soul, like all of y'all, it is very likely at this moment that you are already a young child somewhere else, and you may be a very, very old person elsewhere. Or there's also sharing soul shards. Like suppose, um, Kathy, suppose you're coming into a life and you want to learn the lesson of patience. Maybe your soul is naturally a little... <laughs> <laughs> So maybe you are learning the lesson of patience. Maybe your soul is naturally a little ADHD or naturally like, come on, let's do it. Because our souls have personalities. They're not just like pure energy. We have, you know, we have personalities even when we're not in life. So your soul's like, okay, I need to learn patience. One life you may be going in, you're very patient. The next life you go in, you have no patience. The next life you go in and you are forced to have patience. Maybe you're caring for a disabled person or, you know, you're living alone on a desert island or like who knows what. But you're going to explore patience from many perspectives over many lives. So you're going in and you're like, okay, this life, I gotta have patience. I don't want to have patience, but I gotta be a very, very patient person. And, you know, and there's many ways of being patient. So you might say, like, you'll say to your soul, say to my soul, Benita's soul, you are so patient. I need a sliver of you in me to help me so that I can. Be more patient. And you might go like, you know, to other people's souls and say, souls who have patience, give me. You might come here with like five or six slivers of other souls and they help you with it. Or you might say to some of your past lives, okay, um, past life is watching over me. Make sure you also come into me when I need you. So you might even even feel like, you know, I was I was like ready to scream at this person, then I just felt this calm come over me. I don't know. It's like I wasn't even myself for a moment. And you are still yourself, but one of your past lives might be merging with you. But you can't be two humans. No, you can. Um, yeah, I I. So like for me. Next week, I'm having dinner with another one from my soul. Like, I, you know, there's another person living right now, and we come from the same soul. Now, he doesn't believe in it. Yeah. 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 But from the moment we met many years ago, we have just been like, we just, we love each other so much. And, you know, we can't even define the kind of love we have, but we just like, anytime we can, we spend time together. We're there for each other, living two very different lives. Um, and, you know, and, it has been mentioned by multiple people who have greater sight than I do. You know, like Guruji, uh, Lowell, um, some shamans. They look at us together and they're like, you two are from the same soul. Um, it, it happens sometimes. Um, and again, like, if you are an experienced soul and you're in the middle of your life, another life is already alive and another life of you may have been in their middle life before you were born and you may have shards of yourself in people around 
So you may also be connected with a hundred lives right now. Some of which are all of you, some of which are percentages or portions of you. Depending on how much of yourself you're willing to share with others. When you do a past life regression and you go to a life where you were just a shard of your soul, a splinter of your soul to help someone else, you only remember the part of your life that was relevant, that you were connected with. So someone may, so when you go in like, well, Benita, I did three past life regressions. This one was bright color, like I was in it. And then this next one, it was like watching an old black and white movie that was poorly edited because it was just like jump cuts through scenes. Well, you know which one you were the primary soul and which one you were sharing a soul shard. Okay. okay. Patty. I just wanted to register here. My fault, Patty. I'm saying years ago, you were doing me, Sterling Robinson, you were doing a meeting for me. And I said, okay, so why is it that I have pretty vivid memories of times I was like 25 years old of historical things that happened? Mm -hmm. And I said, I see you know, the example that I gave you was that, okay, I was born in 1949, mm -hmm. and I couldn't remember. Next to the post is in first session, where I was just born in a state. I remember thinking about it. I remember the time when I was around five years old. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't remember much of anything else when I'm five years old. And what he told me was that. I was at that, I was also, besides being a little girl, I was also a man. I remember that life. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, you were a guy who died, like, after you were, after you were born in this life, he died, and that was, yeah. And that's how I learned it. Okay, so I could have two separate lives. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, this Right. Yeah, I recall he was like he was fascinating. He was like some sort of inventor or something. He was a self-made guy, and he was a terrific life. And I remember like so I'm like tranced out. I'm reading Patty's life. I'm reading the life, and it's all flowing through me, and I'm seeing it, and I'm like, and he's kind of speaking through me, and I'm describing what I'm seeing, and and then I was like, and then you know, a diet. She's like, I don't know about that, Bonita, because I was already born then, and I remember like being jolted out of the the trance state, <laughs> and we had to have the discussion of, yeah, this happens, this happens. Why do you have those memories? Mm -hmm. so, that is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you had all that double energy of the end of his life, the beginning of your life. Yeah, and he's with you right now. I see him. So, yes. Um, okay, so let's take a look at our handout. Yes. Um, let's do that later because we have so much material to get into. So before we break for lunch, we'll do the main shares. All right. Now, reincarnation, past life regression. There are so many indigenous and ancient cultures on our planet who this is part of their belief system. If you go to like indigenous beliefs, like uh, aborigines, shamans, like people live in the jungles of, you know, the Amazon rainforest or, uh, you know, the, uh, the people who uh, grew up in Russia as it is now, like all of these ancient cultures, reincarnation is very important because they were more earth connected than we are. And they were more connected to the, the energies on our planet. You know, they weren't locked away in air conditioned buildings. They were one with nature 
all the time. And, you know, like when you go away to a, a country home for a couple of weeks and you're just like in the country, you're like, oh, I'm more aware of the birds. I'm more aware of like snakes and insects in the grass. And, you know, you know, I hear the bees buzzing. I feel the breeze on my face. And then we go back to our work life and our offices and all of that's left behind. People who live this way all night and all day, every day, never lost connection. So you have an entire group of people, like an entire tribe, a village, a race that are very earth connected. So being connected with their past lives, their ancestors of this life, their ancestors of past lives was a normal thing. Um, so why do we reincarnate? You know, if you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, they talk about karmic lessons. I have been lucky enough to have worked with the, the Tibetan Buddhist monks. And Patty, you've met with them. Uh, in conversations with them, which, by the way, they are like the nicest, most happy people. They know the importance of maintaining a terrific frequency. And I figure if these guys, with all they've been through, can enjoy a game of basketball and laugh and smile and just, like, spread good cheer, then, you know, I've got no excuse. <laughs> so I talked to them and I said, you know, this whole thing about karma and, like, tit for tat, you know, I hurt you in this life, next life, you can hurt me. Or if I'm not benevolent in this life, the next life, I'm going to be a street dog or whatever. Um, I said, that's not how it was taught to me. It was taught to me by my librarians, that karma is purely lessons in progress, lessons complete. That's it. And they were laughing and they said, well, yes, that's it. But if you tell that to most people, then they're like, eh, I'll finish it in the next life. Yeah. So you have to give them more structure of if you do not behave this way, bad things will happen to you in your next life because it's too sophisticated otherwise. Uh, your soul doesn't care if you're happy or sad, if you're like, you know, uh, a mass murderer or a nun who's abused or a nun who's happy or a guy living on a mountain like Francis of Assisi talking with you. Your soul doesn't care about any of that. All your soul wants is every experience, every emotion, every thought. However, you need to do the fullness of it and then be done with it. Now, it doesn't mean if you're in a bad situation, you have to explore the fullness of it before you get to be done and go to happy. One thing we'll talk about in the second part of this is if there are elements in your life that bring you below happiness, then look at what's the lesson and get done with it so you can go on to a happier, more fulfilling lesson. Wallowing in distress is never part of the lesson. It's acknowledging learning, moving on. However, you know, the Buddhist and Hindu teachers know that most people won't do that unless they're like, do you want the carrot on the stick or do you want whacking them behind with the stick? Like they need a little whack behind, you know, on their tailbones. So when you go through past life regressions, look at how much of your soul. How much you, of you is your soul? Like, do you have soul shards within you? Or, you know, I mean, you may be thinking you're you and half of you is other people. Whenever anyone comes for a big life, like, you know, the Ascended Masters, like Jesus, Muhammad, Cleopatra, everyone's like, I was Cleopatra. It is possible that everyone claims they were Cleopatra were. Because when people come in for a big life, they put out a calling for shards. And anyone, they can get thousands, millions, billions of soul shards, which helps them, one, have more energy, more power up, 
also, they're connected to the frequency of everyone who gave them a soul shard. So they have a wonderful mandala of love constantly helping them, supporting them. Also, when they're done with life, all those soul shards return to everyone. So the entire karmic lesson of their life is now yours. Your soul's like, good, I learned all those lessons and I don't have to like then do lives to experience them. It's done. And then these lives, when they, when they die and they, they're, you go to the Akashic Library, their life is a public access book. So even if your soul wasn't around when, you know, Buddha lived his life, it doesn't matter. You can go into the library and walk the path of Buddha, read his life, live his life through the library, or however much of his frequency you can connect with. And then you have resolved a lot of karmic lessons and evolved yourself through reading a book as opposed to experiencing the situation. So these soul shards are really amazing and potent tools for personal growth and for like assisting each other's and for our entire collective, our collective collective, you know, evolution. So when you uh, look in yourself, you're like, well, how much of me is me and how much of me is connected to others? Uh, for me, I got a lot of shards connected to me. I'm not an ascended master. I'm not an enlightened one. Um, however, I've got a lot of shards connected to me. And I have to spend a lot of time bringing divine energy into myself and sending it out. Because when I disconnect from my divine state, and I'm just like, oh, I hate the world. People suck. Ugh. Um I'm sending all that energy out to everyone and it's draining for me. So I am like, oh, whatever lesson I'm in, I want to run through it fast so I can get back to like good juice flowing. Okay. The other thing is what karma are you working on and why? What is the purpose? How do you heal in this life and from past life issues? I once, when I was in high school, um, I was very connected to a past life of mine who he lived on a mountain in like what is now Southeastern Europe. And he was a very holy, wise man. People would come to him when they had great questions. But most of the time he was in solitude reading sacred books like the Bible and stuff. And, you know, he had all his animal friends and many spirits. And he was happy that way. And he really helped me with my study. Like he helped me maintain that straight A thing that I felt compelled to do. But my social skills were impacted. So one day I said to him, I'm a teenage girl. I want to go to parties. I want boys to ask me out on dates. You know, I want to be popular. And he's like, Ugh, why? <laughs> I was like, because I'm not an old man on a mountain. So we disconnected that part of his connection to me and maintained the scholarly part. So he helped me with my grades. Like immediately, I started having a full social life. I didn't have to disconnect from him. We just had to like work out our relationship. And there was an immediate difference. I was like, hey, I'm kind of popular now. <laughs> All right. So also, what soul contracts are in action and have been resolved? So again, your first soul contract is to the woman who gives birth to you. I've, because we do not know what soul contracts we have, Many of them are not honored. Many of them are negated. Uh, when I opened my wellness center, I knew for a fact I was supposed to have a business partner open my wellness center with me. It was a huge undertaking. And I knew I was supposed to have someone doing it with me. That person never showed up. 
And so I went forward and I did it on my own. Oh my God, it was so much work. And I kept thought, like, where's my business partner? Where's my business partner? I'm supposed to have one. I later, when uh, talking with, it was Lowell. And I said, my, and you know, Lowell just sees everything. And I remember saying to him, this wellness center is so much work. And he said, yeah, it would have been great if your business partner had shown up, but he's in South America. <laughs> Thank you, Lowell. Something happened in his life that took him elsewhere. So my soul contract was not honored, but my soul contract to open this mind, body, spirit, wellness education center was like powerful enough. I knew I had to do it. And it was very successful. We had a lot of fun there. Yeah. Um, so you had soul contracts. Um, I've done readings for people where I say to them, in this life, like, and again, when I read for people, it's generally someone I've never met before. I know nothing about this person. So I always feel super vulnerable. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm going to offend this person. I don't know. I'm going to. And I just, I can't edit. It just has to flow through. If I edit. I'm going to hold back the vital key that lets them know it's real. So um, sometimes when I'm doing a past life reading for someone, nothing's connecting. And I know I'm giving them like gold and platinum and diamonds of material. And they're like, okay, that's nice. So I'm like, okay, there's something going on in this life that needs to be looked at. So I will give them a life reading for this life. And it will turn out that maybe their parents were supposed to be loving, nurturing parents, but maybe the dad got addiction issues young and the mom was like molested when she was young and they met and married as they were supposed to. They had the children they're supposed to, they're on the life path, but they're not nurturing. They're really messed up. I've seen that happen a few times. So this person who was supposed to grow up in a loving, nurturing family grew up in a non-loving, non-nurturing, you know, kind of situation. It's amazing how many of these people, when I tell them, this is what you're supposed to do, like you're supposed to go to college here, you're supposed to do this, and like, they'll say, oh, I wanted to go to college there, but I didn't have money because my dad took drugs and all the money went to drugs. So I had to go put my, I had to like, move out of the home and put myself through a community college, you know, I'm like, okay, so you went to college, but I'm like, that's so weird of all the colleges out there. The one I name is the one that they had wanted to go to. And then I tell them, this is what you're supposed to do with your life. This is whom you're supposed to meet. And they'll go, well, actually that's what I wanted to do. But, and sometimes they'll go, um, hey, I actually met that person. That's my spouse. Like, so even when we're dishonored, we often find our way back to where we're supposed to be. Um, sometimes someone go way out and like they're like, oh, that life I planned, I'll do that for the next life. I'm having a whole different life. It happens too. But more likely, we're magnetically attracted to the life we plan. So then what's the purpose? Is it for you to learn certain karmic lessons? Is it for you to be in certain places, certain times doing certain things? Or is it for you to absorb certain frequencies? Or are you really mostly here just to help a bunch of other people with their lives? You know, and not even, not like a big Jesus life, just say, well, I've got like 50 souls who I'm like, I'm not even here for me. I'm just like, make sure I'm at certain times and places that I'm supposed to be to help certain people accomplish certain things. And then, so maybe you're a school teacher in that life, or maybe you're uh, a housewife or a house husband and all the neighborhood kids come to you or, you know, minister or something where you have just impacted a lot of people. And you're like, but I feel like my life is meaningless. Well, yeah, it was supposed to the meaning of your life is for everyone else to like springboard off you to where they're supposed to go uh and which is great because then it means you can do whatever you want because all the rest is bonus okay 
Um, so the thing about your life path, we each have what we're drawn to. And we know like the healthiest things we're drawn to and the unhealthy, you know, like I love dating a bad boy, you know, but three dates and I'm like, I'm done with you. <laughs> You're just bad. Um, I'm joking about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, we have what we're attracted to. When you go forward with life, there's going to be an ending place. So the map of your life is where you are now and where you will be at the end with all of your accomplishments and evolutions. When we do the past life regressions, the final stage of the regression is when you leave that body and you rise up and you look at the life path the path planned and the path lived. So practice on this with past lives before we look at our own life. But if you're in the middle of your life and you're like, I don't know where I'm supposed to, like, what, what's the point of my life? One key marker, and you guys are going to laugh, is when someone tells you something they're doing or somewhere they're going and you get really, like, jealous for no reason, you're like, a hundred people can tell me stuff and I'm happy for them. But this one person, I'm just like, oh, I'm so jealous. I hate that person. I just want to take it from them. It's terrible. I love this person. But oh. that's letting you know. That's like your, your soul, your subconscious letting you know there's something you're supposed to go or do that has been triggered to recognition by this. You're not really jealous of, I mean, maybe you are like, what's that young putz doing with something I'm working so hard for and I'm not getting? Well, maybe you should talk with that young putz and find out like what they're doing to make it happen. Or maybe it's a reminder of you're going after something that you want a lot, but maybe you should be like 12 degrees to the right and go after that thing. Maybe you're you're like generally on the right path, but not on the right exact path. So talking with this person of their stuff will make you realize, oh, you know, that's great for them. But actually, I don't want what, you know, when I learn the realities of what they have, the rose colored glasses come off and I realize I want something a little different. I'm not willing to do the work that they need to do or give up what they have to give up for that. Like many people have been jealous of me being uh, a chef, having a career as a chef. They're like, oh, that's so wonderful. I love eating in nice restaurants. And I bet you get to drink wine and try all the good food. I'm like, no, you as a customer, that's what you do. Me as a chef, 14 hours a day in a 110 degree kitchen with a 500 degree live flame in my face, moving quickly with things that can cut me and burn me while temperamental men are screaming like like Gordon Ramsay is a cream cup puff compared to the men I've worked with and they all are sweaty and they smell so bad and they're all like eating garlic and drinking coffee and then getting close to me to talk and then I have to like lift all these heavy boxes and go in a walk-in refrigerator or a freezer for 20 minutes to like put things away and you know, like very different from, you know, sipping wine and eating good food. So when people hear what I do, they're like, oh yeah, you keep doing what you're doing so I can do what I'm doing. Well, it's the same. Anytime you feel that overriding passionate emotion, be it excitement or jealousy or like, oh, I hate you for that you know, honor it and say, well, what is this telling me? There's, it's like, an, it's like a, a warning light saying, hey, there's some, finally, finally you're paying attention to something. And like, you may not actually be, you think you're jealous that this person's going to go backpacking through the jungles of Borneo, past all the venomous snakes and scorpions and 
you know, animals that want to eat them and million mosquitoes every minute. And you're like, oh, no, I'm not jealous of that. But I do want to go to Borneo and stay in a resort. So I'm going to put that on the list and save my money for that. Okay, good to know. So, or you're like, no, I don't want to do that, but they're going to be making a documentary. And I realize I want to make a documentary, but it's about something else. So don't abuse yourself for any like automatic emotion that springs up. That emotion can be like the beginning of a path of self-exploration and it has to do with your life path. Yes. Okay. Um, so what can we do in this life to heal past lives or to help them evolve a little bit? I guarantee you'll have past lives that you're like, oh, I hate that guy. That guy's terrible. Because we've explored everything. I have one past life. I was like, God, he's the worst. It took me like a good five years of working with him before I could even like talk to him without sneering and like, like, oh, he was terrible. And he was, he was a real jerk. But he died like 5,000 years ago. He's evolved a little bit. However, we still have to work together on some of his issues to undo some of the damage he did and, and evolve everyone. So he's a major character in the book I'm writing, um, Harness Your Inner Fire. And I'm working on it, but right now it's like 800 pages. I got to whittle it down to 200. <laughs> I think it'll be a few more books popping up. I just kept writing and writing, and I'm like, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so how do we connect with our higher support, get help from ourselves? We're going to do a little of that today. Uh, we're going to do two past life regressions. The first one, I'm going to take you on a hypnotic journey. And it will be a little bit of a meandering, hypnotic, and just go with it. The point of it is to get us out of our logical awake brain and into that state where you're not awake, you're not asleep. You're just like daydreaming, but you're not planning it. It's just happening for you. And we're going to end up in a hallway that has all these doors. And then... When you go up to a door, you may find that the exterior of the door will indicate the life behind it. Or you may find it's just a hallway of doors. This hallway may be in outside of time and space, or it may be a hallway in a house like your childhood home. You know, the hallway may shift a little bit, but we will go through several different doors. When we go through a door to a past life, um, you may find yourself in your past life, or you may find yourself floating around looking at your past life, or you may be like, it's all black. I'm not a visual person, Benita. And then just receive however you receive. You may just find your inner eye or your inner knowledge is just there, or you have a knowingness. So whether, no matter, like, don't count on any one sense. Just like, Go along, and you may find like your brain is telling you the story verbally, you know. And sometimes you find yourself telling it, and it's okay to tell your brain to relax, but you might need that because this is a new thing for you. Like, don't worry if you're giving yourself the training wheels on your bicycle to get through this. Um, and we will sort of skip through the light. We won't necessarily appear at the birth of the life. It might be you're in your mid-20s or it might be whatever. So, you know, I will be saying, like, look around, you know, what do you look like? And you're like, I don't know. I'm in me. I don't know what I look like. It doesn't matter. Like, I'll ask a variety of questions. If you don't have an answer for a question, just wait for the next question. But you may find the information starts flowing in later as we're going forward. And then we'll go, I'll say, now we're going to leave this moment, go to the next moment. The next moment may be literally the next moment, or it may be like five years later. You know, We will end at you know the final moment, the death, that life. 
don't need, you don't need to feel traumatized because you are not dying. You're just experiencing the death of that life. That life may have died in trauma or that life may have died with like joy and grace. I had one life, she was sort of walking and she fell down a ravine and broke like bones in her neck and back. And she was lying on her back, looking up, just seeing the expanse of nature around her, knowing no one would come to help her. And she just lay there feeling so filled with gratitude that if this was going to be her final moment, she was not in pain. She had like severed her spinal cord. And she was just like looking at the beauty of the nature around her and knowing that she had had a life filled with love. You know, and I was like, dang, I should be so lucky to die that way in this life. So you never know. And then you will rise up. You may find that that life is in their body and they're talking with you throughout the body. Like you're the companion and they're telling you, or you may find that you're like floating above and the soul of that life is floating with you. And the two of you are watching that life happen. Or you may be reading a newspaper and you're reading the obituary of that life. You know, it's these past life regressions can be any which way. I have a woman who, uh, the past lives come through uh, like a radio program, like an old timey radio program story, you know, like a, the scripted 1940s radio shows. So just accept it however it comes in. At the end, after the person's death, and we'll watch the soul float up to where they're met. It's often a waiting room and the soul of that life, if they're chatting with you, will be there. They, you, you may see them with loved ones waiting for them. They will do a life review. And this is something that we all do when we're done with life. You do a life review. It is always interesting and in a way beautiful. That's a chance for you to see like where you are like, in alignment with your life path and where you're like, oh, I wasn't even supposed to do that. Well, that's a bonus karmic lesson or, oh, I really messed up or, oh, that's why that person did that to me. I Because it set me on a path that I had to go on. You know, like um, I had a life where my father beat me and kicked me out of the house. And like, you're gone forever. He needed to do that so that I would go forward to a path that I, that was my life path. That was part of the pre-planned situation. So, you know, and in that life I had forgiven him, but watching, I'm like, oh, now it makes sense. Yeah, so you get to see all of that and then you'll rise up and return to the hallway. And we will walk down the hallway till we find another door. We'll try to do three past lives. Okay. And um, well, we're not going to go through the rest of this just now because I want to do regressions. Um, let's take like a couple of minutes. Everyone can go to the bathroom. Going into a hypnotic state when you have to pee is a terrible thing. <laughs>